Well, I want to welcome everybody. We're starting a new quarter this morning, and so uh, we have uh, three different classes going. Uh, Britt is teaching Luke in uh, the fellowship hall. Uh, the young couples are meeting over here, and they're, ma they're uh, studying the marriage. Uh, it's from a book called After You Say I Do. And in here, we're going to start a series on the foundations for disciples. And uh, in just a few moments, I will explain what we're going to be doing and why. Because uh, there was a Barna. Has anybody ever heard of Barna Research people? Barna is a group of people. It's, it's an organization. And they do studies on Christian organizations. It's not just the church of Christ. It's all religions. And... Uh, they, they do all kinds of studies to find out all different kinds of things about how churches are doing, how Christianity, uh, according to how they call Christianity, is doing in America. And uh, they do a good, good job. They really do. They do a good job of what they come up with. And uh, before we get started, uh, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. I don't have a pen. Got one. But do we have any special prayer requests before we get started this morning? I do want to tell you that last, uh, last week, my granddaughter, she's expecting uh, the middle of this month. And uh, last week, I got a phone call that something was going wrong. And so uh, later, we found out that she's uh, got, uh, she had low iron. And so they took care of it. She's in good shape. They're giving her iron. I don't know how they're, I think trans, transfusions or something like that. But anyway, she's doing great. So, but they really don't think she's going to make it to the middle of the month, which that would be great too. I'm looking forward to that next great grandchild. Uh, we don't know what, what it's going to be yet, but I'm excited about it for them. Any other prayer requests we may have? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Yes, ma'am. She has what? Oh, my. Yeah, it's that time of year, too. Any others? Okay, let's go to our Father in prayer. Our Father, we are so grateful to you that you have given us this opportunity to come and study your word. Father, it's our prayer that we will be the people of your word and will know your word and follow your word. And Father, help us to have the strength and the courage to stand up and the strength and, stir, stir, uh, and, and the courage to say no when necessary. And Father, we bring before you this morning these two that have been mentioned for Cindy who has suffered a seizure. Father, we pray that you be with her and her family at this time and give them strength and comfort. We pray, Father, for Pam who is uh, suffering from the flu. And we ask, Father, for recovery for her and strength and comfort. And Father, we ask you to be with us as we study to be more like Jesus in Christ's name. Amen. I said, uh, talked, to, mentioned about Barna. Barna came up with a uh, something, and a preacher uh, took off on it, and then he uh, put a sermon together by it. And I stole what he said in an introduction of a sermon, but it came from Barna. It's the, the Barna Research people themselves, and here's. Here's what he is, he's telling us. He said only 49% of college freshmen enrolling in Christian universities in America have a, uh, have a thought out philosophy in life. 
Now what that means is nearly half of all our college students is entering in just to Christian colleges. They don't have direction. Now who enrolls in Christian colleges? Mostly those who come from churches. Only 49% of them have a direction in life, a thought out philosophy. They are not doing nothing more than just living from day to day and not giving any or much thought about what is most important in life. Now, here's what they came up with in their study. The problem is not a lack of direction. It's not a matter of lack of direction. What they've come up with, the problem is lack of direction among Christians. Here's what they said. The ambiguous nature of many churchgoers, I want to underline that word, the ambiguous nature of many churchgoers' beliefs has trickled down to the next generation, so much so that these young people have nothing they really live for. They simply are mimicking what they have observed. As believers, we should know what we believe. We can't go around preaching platitudes and morals and all the while being ignorant of God's Word. We need to be in the Word. We have to build our convictions on what God has told us, and we have to commit ourselves fully to the cause of Christ so we'll stand the test of faith that comes our way. And here's what they've concluded. The next generation's best hope of gaining a godly perspective of life is this present generation's willingness to show them purpose for life. If they don't learn it from us, where are they going to learn it? From the world. Brethren, I guarantee you, if we don't teach our young people what the Word of God says and how to live, the culture will teach them not to listen to the Word of God. And that's what Barna has discovered. Duh. It took research to figure that out. So instead of shaking our heads at the younger generation today, the present generation needs to start living for Christ and start teaching what Christ taught about life, about importance, about purpose, and salvation in Christ. Here's what they concluded. We must give the next generation a godly purpose in life by pursuing godliness, uh, godless, godless, godliness ourselves and passing it on. What they're actually saying is, for some reason, a lot of our young people have not received a solid foundation to build their lives on. And they're coming from the church. So what's going on? What has happened? I think maybe we have bought into this concept that, well, if they see it, they'll catch on. That's not necessarily true. They need to hear it. They need to see it. And they need to be taught it. Because if, they don't, if they're not taught it, they'll never catch it. So Jesus had something to say about foundations, did he not? In Matthew chapter 7, after Jesus had taught the Beatitudes and what they look like in the life of a disciple, he comes to the closing of this sermon. And he ends his sermon with an idea or concept of a foundation. And he says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. 
The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on stand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew, and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. Did Jesus say building our lives on a solid foundation is paramount if we're going to survive the storms of this life? Absolutely. He said it is paramount because I want you to notice something. He didn't say if the storms come. What did he say? When. Anybody in here ever experienced storms of life? Yeah, okay. What gives us a foundation to survive the storms of life? And by the way, if we have Christ in us, then we have a target on our back. And guess who is shooting at us all the time? Satan. And he is going to bring storms from every direction that he can to try to knock us down. And Jesus said, if you will stand on his word and you will do what it says, in other words, it, we've got to do what Jesus said if we're going to survive. Now, I want to tell you there's a difference. There is a difference between being a church member and a disciple of Jesus Christ. There's two approaches to church. One approach is, well, I am a member of the church, and when you say that, you're basically saying it's kind of like being a member of the Kiwanis Club. In other words, I go to most of the meetings, and I generally adhere to the rules, and I pay my dues. But it's not my lifestyle. It's just something I do once or twice a month to go to a meeting. And I am called a faithful Kiwanis Club member. Now I want to ask you a question. Just because a church member is here every time the doors open, does that mean automatically they're faithful? No. No. What is the difference then? Jesus did not call us to be church members. He called us to be disciples. You see, I can be a faithful church member, but not a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. It's a matter of mindset. So I'm going to show you the difference this morning, because as I studied what Barna had to say about this, we're missing the foundation. And here's what they've discovered the, member, the church member concept is what our kids are falling into, and in the process, they're falling away from Christ. Now, don't be threatened when I say church member. All of us in here are members of the church if we've been baptized into Christ. But does it mean we are all disciples? There's a big difference. And I'm going to share that with you this morning because we need, I believe, to go back to some foundations. And by the way, there's some things happening in this church that I wish I could tell you now, but there's some exciting things coming that's going to help us understand what it means to make disciples and be in the process of doing that. But in order to make a disciple, we've got to see what that actually means, don't we? So here we go. Let's look at the mindset between discipleship and church membership. First of all, church members go to church. Well, that's what they're supposed to do, right? Do you know what disciples do? Disciples are the church. Now, what's the difference here? If all I do is go to church, 
and I live the rest of the week the way I want to live it, am I a disciple of Christ? Not necessarily. To be the church, and by the way, when Jesus promised to build his church, he wasn't talking about something kind of like the Kiwanis Club. He wasn't talking something like the Lions Club. He wasn't talking about joining the Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts. He was talking about something far greater than that. He was talking about a force that was going to be on this earth that was not going to be defeated by Satan. You remember what he told Peter in Matthew? Matthew chapter 16. Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church. Now, what is the rock or the foundation of the church? Well, what did Peter just admit? What did he confess? He confessed that Jesus was the Son of God. He is the Christ. He is the Messiah. And Jesus said, upon this rock, the rock is the foundation upon which the church is built. And brethren, the foundation is Jesus Christ. And He will not fail us. He is the solid foundation. And if He is a solid foundation and we are part of the building stones, then how solid is this foundation going to be? I will tell you, Jesus himself said, he said the gates of hell will not even prevail against it. In other words, death itself will not destroy the church. Satan and all of his activity will never destroy the church. But if I'm just a member and all I do is just go every now and then, Where's my foundation? My foundation is in church membership, not discipleship. Because if the church does something I don't like, or if I get easily offended, my salvation is not in Christ. It's based on how you behave and whether I like it or not. That's a pretty flimsy foundation, isn't it? Brethren, we are the church. We are that instrument which Christ is using to beat back the kingdom of Satan. And our kids need to understand this. They need to know who they are. They need to know it based on what they observe in us. Because it is our responsibility to teach them, not the other way around. Have you ever tried to have your kid? Are you ever follow the advice of your kids? With all their vast experience in life, just how much do they really know? The world's trying to convince them they know more than we do. And if they don't have a solid foundation, they will fall for it. So, church members go to church, disciples are the church, and they never forget that. Secondly, church members talk about Jesus. They talk a lot about Jesus. What's the difference between a church member and a disciple? Disciples follow Jesus. By the way, where was Jesus headed when he told the disciples, follow me? Where was he headed? Where was his ultimate, ultimate um, destination in this world? A cross. It was a cross. And do you remember what he said in the Sermon on the Mount? When he finished, the, when he got to the last beatitude, do you remember what he said? When they falsely accuse, lie about you, and persecute you because of me, rejoice, because great is your reward in heaven. Brethren, if you don't have a solid foundation, when they lie, when they falsely accuse, 
and when they persecute, if your foundation is built on anything else, what did Jesus say at the end of his sermon? You're going to fall. And he said, great will be that crash. It will be great. And so we need to understand we follow Jesus to a cross. Jesus didn't die on the cross because he didn't have anything better to do that day. Jesus willingly took it because it was the Father's will. And if we follow Jesus, we will take it. We will take it if it's the Father's will. We will take the slings and the arrows and the stones. We will take the verbal abuse. We will take what it, the world throws at us. We will take the name calling. And we will not be offended. Rather, we will rejoice because we're standing on the solid foundation of Jesus Christ. We're not going to allow this culture to tell us what's right and wrong. They have been wrong every time they've tried it. And it's up to the solid foundation on which the church stands that we do not listen to culture. We impact culture. And sometimes they will listen and sometimes they will not. And we have got to teach our young people you are following Jesus to a cross. And by the way, a disciple is not a fan of Jesus. A disciple is down on the field with Jesus. Jesus is not looking for fans. He's looking for fanatics that will get into the game with him. That's what he's looking for. He's looking for disciples. He's looking for those who will get down in the dirt and fight with him. Church members make good fans. And they can sit on the sidelines. And they can clap and root for their team. But brethren, the final score is not determined on how loud the fans scream. The final score, by the way, has already been posted. We win because of Jesus. Not only that, church members have a religion about God. Well, don't we have a religion that's about God? Brethren, it has got to transcend religion about God. It's got to transcend with a relationship with God. Jesus said in Matthew chapter, uh, excuse me, John chapter 17 in what we call the prayer, the priestly prayer. It was the prayer in the garden. And Jesus made an interesting statement. He said, this is eternal life. That they know you and they know me. Turn to John 17 if you have your Bibles with you. It's in verse 3 of John chapter 17. Matter of fact, I'm going to just start reading from verse 1. I want you to hear closely what Jesus prayed. After Jesus said this, he looked towards heaven and prayed. Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to, those, to all those who have given, you have given. Now this is eternal life. What? That they may know you the only and true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Now that is what I call a life and death verse. 
Eternal life is based on knowing God and knowing Jesus. I used to illustrate it this way, and I'd ask the students, how many in here know Abraham Lincoln? Well, none of them did. How many in here have a, know a lot of facts about Abraham Lincoln? Well, some could come up with a few facts. How do we get to know somebody? Ladies, how do you get to know your husbands or your boyfriends? You spend time with them? You, uh, it's, it's, it's more than just a casual once or twice date a month, isn't it? You spend time with them, you get to know them, and you literally, ladies, I know this, you want to crawl into their heads, don't you? You want to crawl into their heads and know them, how they think, what they like, what's their favorite to this, and what do they don't like. You want to know that. Why? So you will know them. Brethren, we have the very brain, if you will, of Christ. Here are the brains, if you will, of God. This is what God wants us to know. And what is that? What he likes, what he doesn't like, what he wills, what he doesn't will, how he wants us to live. Why? Not just to please him, but to glorify him. Why does he want that? He tells us. We've got to spend time with him. And I will tell you, one date, one hour for every week is never enough. If I only dated my former wife only once a week and only for one hour, and the rest of the time she's totally off my mind, I would have never known her. It's almost like you have to consume it. This is how we know Jesus. This is how we know God. It's not just a religion, brethren. It is a relationship. We've got to get into his mind and get his mind into ours. And it's called transformation. And it will happen. Church members not only do that. Church members normally pray for what they want. I think it's interesting <clears throat> that uh, James had something to say about prayer in James. James said, you know, you pray for it, you don't get it. You beg and you plead and it doesn't happen. And the reason, do you remember he said, you know, here's why God's not answering your prayers. Do you remember what he said? You pray for with wrong motives. You're praying for what you want. Disciples pray for what God wants. The prayer is hard. But what does God want from each one of us? What does he want from us? He wants to use us. To what end? To what purpose? I think Paul said it very well in Ephesians when he said that it was God's purpose from the very beginning that the church would display the wisdom of God. That's our purpose. Well, what does that mean? Well, we have to understand the wisdom of God. Get into his mind. The purpose of the church is not to get what the church wants. The purpose of the church is do the will of God regardless of the price she has to pay. Isn't that exactly what Jesus did? What did he want when he was in the garden? He was facing the cross. Father, if there's what? If I can get out of this thing, 
If there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. That was his prayer. That's what he wanted. But then what did he say? Yet not what I want, but what you want. Not my will, but your will. So my question is, what does God want from this church? What does he really want from us? I know what we pray for. And by the way, it's not wrong to pray for the sick. One, one afternoon or one night, my wife was in a wheelchair and I had the elders. We asked the elders to surround her and pray for her. And God said no. I know what we wanted. But then part of the prayer was, God be glorified. Now, which is more important? God being glorified or are we getting what we want all the time? See, disciples pray very dangerous prayers based on what God wants. And sometimes that's hard. Not only that, church members confess they make mistakes. <laughs> what does God tell us to do? Confess our sins. What's the difference? We are to confess our sins. I don't think he means we got to get specific and name everyone. I think what he wants us to do is, first of all, confess to one another. We're not perfect. We're not perfect. As a matter of fact, in 1 John chapter 1, I think it was John himself that said, if you say you have no sin, you're lying to yourself and everybody else. That was my version of it. He said, however, if you walk in the light as he's in the light, the blood of Christ, what? You continually confess what? I'm a sinner. You confess it. And then his blood will what? Continually cleanse you. The biggest sinner in this church is standing before you right now. We've all sinned. We've all blown it. We need to confess we're sinners. Now, why is that important? What impression do people who are lost and are looking for God what impression do they get if we walk around acting like we have got it all together? <laughs> do you know who really is better at helping people who are struggling with alcohol? Former alcoholics who are still struggling. You know who the best people in the world are to help others? With, as they struggle with other things in life, those who have struggled with it. The best comforters are those who have received comfort in the past. Admit it. We're all sinners. Not only that, church members have a doctrine about music. Now, don't, don't, don't throw anything at me yet, okay? I think the Bible is very clear on, on, on singing. But if that is our major argument, then I think we missed the point. You see, disciples just sing. Church members get out the hymnal or they look up here on the screen and they sing because the Bible says I've got to sing, so I've got to sing. And the heart's not in it. Disciples put their hearts in it, and they sing. Matter of fact, you can't shut them up sometimes. When I preached in Guyana one time, I thought I was never going to get up the pulpit. I mean, it was just one song after another, and then on top of all of that, guess what happens? When another family walks in, they stop everything they're doing and hug them. They really get this holy kiss thing down. I mean, they got it down. And they greet each other. But they sing. 
They sing with their hearts. And it does make a difference. It really does. I wish I, wished I could just take all the all to Guyana with me. <laughs> Even talk about an experience. Not only that, church members believe in going to church. Well, aren't we supposed to go to church? Aren't we supposed to be here this morning? Our shepherds have set aside this time because God said we're to meet on the first day of the week. And our shepherds have told us when, so we're supposed to be here, right? Brethren, let me tell you something. Disciples bring people to church. And that's the difference. Disciples bring others to Christ. Now, if I bring a person to Christ, that means that they obey the gospel. That means they're baptized into Christ Jesus. That means they have become the church. I have a question. Is that the end of the story for them? No. We bring them to Christ they will be the church. And they will be where the church meets. And there's a big difference. Just believing and going to church is not the same as bringing others to Christ. Not only that, Church members listen to and critique sermons. Now, I've got to confess something here. The Air Force did a lot of great things for me. When I became an instructor, the first time I was at Shepherd Air Force Base, I went there in 1970. They sent me to a school to teach me how to teach. They sent me to a school to teach me how to organize lessons. They sent me to school to teach me how to study. They did all of this. They, they taught me how to write curriculum. It was a phenomenal thing because what I discovered is every bit of that translates right into ministry and preaching and teaching. That was wonderful. And I was there for four or three years and I taught and I loved it. I found out that that was something that was in me that I couldn't stop. And so it also translated in the church where we attended. And I did a lot of teaching there, but just applying what the Air Force taught me. Well, I went back to Alaska for five years. And then guess what? I'm back to Shepherd Air Force Base again. Not as an instructor this time, but as an instructor supervisor. I didn't get to teach. I had 12 instructors that worked for me, and they did the teaching. Guess what my job was? Evaluating instructors. And I had this list, and I had to, I had to evaluate every instructor at least once every three months. And I had this sheet, and it was either they did or they didn't. They did or they didn't. It was very objective. The problem was, I can't get it out of my head now. So when somebody gets up to preach or teach, guess what? Automatically goes right into my brain. And I really have to work hard at getting that Form 214 out of, or, or 284 out of my, my head when somebody gets up to teach because it actually is a distraction from actually hearing the lesson and the points, and the message. And so I struggle with that one because what the Air Force did to me, so it's their fault, not mine. <laughs> Brethren, disciples are living sermons. They're living sermons. They don't just hear them. They live them. Church members, they know facts, doctrines, and rituals. Disciples know God.
Now, if we know God, are we going to know the facts? Yes. Are we going to have the doctrines? Yes. Are we going to have certain rituals, if you will, worship time together, and we're going to do certain things together? Yes. But brethren, I maintain you can do every bit of that and still not know God. Have you noticed anything on this list that I just gave you? Which side would give us a solid foundation and which side would probably not be very well accommodating if the pressure came and the temptations were strong and the culture were beating against them? Which side, which column would be more likely to fall. Church member, we've got to get beyond just being a member. We got to be the church. Because if our young people don't see that, and if they don't have this foundation, then let us not be surprised when they graduate They not only leave home, they leave the church. Jesus talked about a very solid foundation. What are we teaching our young? What are we teaching our new Christians? Brethren, my question is, what are we teaching one another? So which side are we on here in this congregation? Which side do we need to be on? And how do we get there? And if we are there, how do we pass it on? That's what this class is going to be about. It's going to be about how we can do that, what we can do, and the things we need to know to make it happen. Because, brethren, I am not convinced, and there's no way you can convince me, that God wanted this congregation to be here just so we could get up on Sunday mornings and come meet together for a couple hours and go home. I do not believe that's the mission God has given West Freeway. And if that's all we're doing, are we really doing what He's called us to do? He has given us a mission... and. <laughs> Hold me down, brother. (laughs) I want to say it so bad, but I won't. There's some things coming that's going to help us. And I see a phenomenal future for this church. I see this church going to not only be impacting Fort Worth. This church is going to have an impact in churches all across America. As a matter of fact, it already is. I am. Most of you know I'm part of... uh, of a home mission. Uh, so, so is Ron. Well, I tell you, he jumped in with both feet. Great guy. We're helping small churches to rediscover why they're here, what their purpose is, and the things they can do in their community to make a difference. And it's happening, and it can happen here. I think there's a lot of enthusiasm because this church has gotten out of a tremendous debt. And you are phenomenally blessed now. All of us are because of where we are. Do you know how many cars go up and down in front of this church building and down I-30 every day? Almost a half a million. This is probably prime real estate in Fort Worth, Texas for a church building to be. Do you know how many would go across Chapin Road in front of Western Hills a day? (laughs) Probably 200. God has given us a tremendous place to minister to a dying world. And I think we need to take advantage of it. And part of taking advantage of it is going to be teaching our people and our young people how to be disciples and what it means. Pray with me. 
Father, as we start this, this study, Father, I pray your blessings on this congregation. Help us, Father, to be what you want us to be, to be the shining light in this community. But not just this community, Father. Help us to reach out all across this nation in making disciples that will have an impact on this world and this culture that will literally turn this culture upside down. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you so much.